excellencies, <clears throat> distinguished colleagues, uh, guests, good morning. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be back here and it's, it is a, an honor to be amongst all of you. I would really like to start by extending my sincere appreciation to PRIO and the Norwegian Center for Holocaust and Minority Studies for co-hosting this <coughs> very important uh, seminar on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda and for inviting me to address you on a very important but at the same time very difficult theme of gender and atrocity prevention. We are gathered today in a stark reminder of the unspeakable horrors of the world uh, which the world witnessed in Rwanda in 1994. You will recall that in less than three months, a million people were deliberately and systematically killed. Lives, dreams and aspirations were cut short as hate speech fueled violent action targeting the Tutsi population. In that same period, between 100,000 to 250,000 women were estimated to have been raped, and survivors of such violence left with little to no support from the international community. However, the initial silence and inaction from the global community later ignited progress towards accountability, fostering peace and stability, and promoting reconciliation in Rwanda, when in 1998, the I ICC, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, determined conclusively that a genocide was indeed committed against the Tutsi. This was the first international court to recognize rape and sexual violence as a component of genocide under international law, signifying that conflict-related sexual violence was an integral part of the process of destruction. Additionally, the court found that acts of rape and sexual violence may amount to crimes against humanity, marking an important milestone in addressing impunity for acts of sexual violence, including as a means of perpetrating genocide and related crimes. When states came together for the 2005 World Summit, at which they unanimously endorsed the responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. The international community was reeling from atrocities in the Balkans and Rwanda, which had shocked the conscience of humanity. And it was there that the then Secretary General Kofi Annan told the gathering in no uncertain terms, you will be forced to act if another Rwanda looms. Member States agreed in the World Summit Outcome document that such responsibility entailed the prevention of such crimes, including their incitement, that they had a collective responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful means to help protect populations from atrocity crimes, and that they were prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council, should peaceful means be inadequate and where national authorities were manifestly failing to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. And a few years later, the world responded to the widespread systematic sexual violence in Darfur and Eastern DRC through the creation of my mandate with the adoption of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1888 in 2009. But today, 30 years on, we meet at a time when violence and atrocities continue unabated in many contexts and where the utility of the R2P seems to be declining, as crises such as Myanmar, Sudan, and Gaza are assiduously ignored by the countries expected to be intervening. We meet at a time when the R2P's reputation is taking a serious hit 
with the doctrine being branded as an a la carte one, with questions being raised as to whether the war in Gaza, Sudan, and Myanmar constitute the final nail in the coffin of R2P. <clears throat> Today we meet at a moment of great global turbulence, where conflicts are raging, tensions are rising, and coups are erupting, with the clock having turned backwards on women's rights in settings like Afghanistan, Sudan, Myanmar, Haiti, and the Middle East, to name but a few. Displacement is at a record high. Global military expenditure is at a record-breaking USD 2.2 trillion, and more than 600 women and girls are currently living in conflict-affected countries. While conflict-related sexual violence is not explicitly mentioned in the R2P doctrine, it is no longer disputed that widespread or systematic sexual violence may constitute atrocity crimes. Security Council in its resolution 1820 underscored that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or constitutive acts with respect to gen genocide, depending on the facts of the case. And this really ushered in a historic shift in paradigm and perspective from sidelining sexual violence merely as random acts of a few renegade soldiers, an inevitable byproduct of war or form of collateral damage, to addressing it with greater alacrity as a self-standing threat to collective security and impediment to the restoration of peace. And this sent a clear signal that sexual violence, even in the midst of war, is preventable and not inevitable. It is <clears throat> recognized that sexual violence is used and commissioned as a tactic of war to humiliate, dominate, terrorize, displace members of a targeted community or ethnic group, shredding the social fabric that binds people together with corrosive effects on social cohesion. The creation of my mandate and the appointment in 2009 of the SRSG laid further emphasis on the gender aspect of the responsibility to protect. And since the creation of my mandate, atrocity crimes have been documented through the monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangements in the United Nations Peace uh, Operations for Conflict-Related Sexual Violence, and my office has been tasked with the preparation of the annual report of the Secretary General for its consideration by the Security Council. In April, the 15th annual report of the Secretary General was debated before the Security Council, and it brought to light the stark and disturbing reality of CRSV across 21 situations of concern in a context where we documented a dramatic increase of 49% increase in verified cases compared to the previous year. And this spike is particularly alarming in a global context where humanitarian access remains severely restricted and constrained, with survivors not receiving the urgent and critical comprehensive assistance they require. As we speak, Sudan is today the world's largest displacement crisis, with almost 9 million people displaced in just over a year, with women and girls facing increasing risk of sexual violence while flee fleeing conflict. The RSF military operations across Darfur, and more recently in El Fasha, has intensified the risk of atrocity crimes, particularly for civilians from non-Arab -Ar co communities, given the ethnically charged nature of the current violence. And since the conflict began, in April 2023, the UN has received credible information on the abduction of women and girls held in captivity, including reports of women and girls raped and kept in slave-like conditions. There are reports that women and girls abducted in Khartoum were taken to other parts of the Sudan, notably the Darfur region, allegedly in chains in the back of trucks. In this climate, 
of extreme uncertainty. It is not an overstatement to ask whether international law is an empty promise, whether our collective responsibility to protect is more honored in the breach than the observance, and whether ensuring and achieving accountability for some of the worst crimes imaginable is within our reach. The atrocity crime of CRSV has indeed been rightly called history's greatest silence and remains one of the most frequently committed yet least condemned crimes of war. Indeed, every new wave of warfare brings with it a rising tide of sexual violence. The ancient trilogy of wartime terror, looting, pillage, and rape, which should long ago have been consigned to the history books, remains in our daily headlines. Over 15 years since R2P was endorsed by the UN General Assembly, and almost 15 years since the inception of the Security Council agenda to combat CRSV, some progress can be assessed, namely in terms of normative evolution, institutional capacity, and operational impact. And there are some striking and instructive parallels between the trajectories of these two agenda. The international community has already set the normative framework by which CRSV should and can be prevented, starting with the adoption of Council Resolution 1820. The Security Council mandate on CRSV was built on the WPS, WPS agenda, which affirmed that no conflict or crisis is gender neutral and no effective response can be gender blind. Nearly a quarter of a century since its adoption, efforts to successfully link equality, social stability, and durable peace in the context of atrocity prevention uh, remains hindered. For example, gender equality today is today recognized as the number one predictor of peace, more than a nation's level of development, democracy, or religious and ethnic identity. So that this means that we can no longer treat the subjects of world peace and women's rights as separate conversations. Crimes of sexual and gender-based violence, therefore, can no longer be siloed from discussions of mass atrocity crimes. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda is not solely the statement of a problem, but also the expression of a transformative solution and an alternative vision to the seemingly endless cycles of conflict, militarized mascul masculinity, inequality, and entitlement. Of course, there are challenges inherent in the foregrounding gender in our analysis of atrocity crimes. The tyranny of the emergency prompts many actors at a time of acute crisis to argue that women can wait and to dismiss gender as a soft issue that is secondary to hard security matters and that is why it cannot be left in an ad hoc manner to the goodwill of individuals but must be systematized through training, mainstreaming, resourcing and accountability. In terms of some striking and instructive parallels between the trajectories of the two agenda, firstly, we note the normative force of the responsibility to protect the doctrine, which has been widely felt in international relations with global standards set and becoming well established, notably of sovereignty reconceived as responsibility, primarily to citizens, but also to the international community at large. The doctrine has been invoked in numerous Security Council resolutions since 2006 and has, to a certain extent, influenced innovations such as the responsibility of permanent members of the Council to refrain from using the veto when confronted with atrocity crimes. Though, sadly, lately we have all witnessed a different trend. Likewise, successive Security Council resolutions have made it clear that as a crime of concern to the international community as a whole, sexual violence must 
be addressing transitional justice processes and uh, excluded from the scope of amnesty provisions. Both agendas remind us that the normative framework is robust. What is needed now is not new standards of behavior, but better adherence to those that exist. Secondly, in terms of institutional arrangements, advancement around atrocity prevention and the responsibility to protect has catalyzed more organized and structured attention to atrocity prevention across the UN system, spearheaded by the Office of the Prevention of Genocide and Responsibility to Protect, and through the global network of R2P focal points. Similarly, the UN is today equipped, as never before, with the infrastructure to prevent and respond to the historically hidden crime of CRSV under the strategic leadership of my mandate. And this includes the multi-sectoral interagency coordination network that I chair, known as UN, UN Action Against Sexual Violence in, in Conflict, comprising today of 25 UN entities, but also a team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence in conflict, which aims to strengthen rule of law and uh, institutional safeguards against impunity for these crimes at the national level. Turning to the vexed but critical question of operational impact, I would note that both agendas are first and foremost prevention agendas, which aim to reduce the risk of atrocity crimes before they occur, including by ending the culture of impunity that fuels violations and emboldens their authors. In both agendas, we are at an inflection point how can we translate commitments into compliance and resolutions into results? How can our collective responsibility yield a real-time collective response? The normative frameworks and institutional arrangements exist for rapid and coordinated action to react swiftly to imminent abuses, incitement, and hate speech before nations and peoples are plunged into crisis. On a positive note, there is no doubt that the UN system is today reaching and supporting thousands of survivors of wartime sexual violence who had once been invisible and inaccessible. Peacekeepers are now systematically trained to detect, deter, and respond to sexual violence as part of their operational readiness standards to protect civilians. The mandate authorizations and renewals of peacekeeping and special political missions include directives on sexual violence prevention and response, though I must say that an increasing surge in mission drawdowns put at risk these operational gains, and we must ensure the reinforcement of women protection advisor capacity in these contexts. Specific designation criteria on sexual violence have been included in seven UN sanctions regime, which I brief on a regular basis as part of leveraging behavioral change and opening space for a protection dialogue with belligerent parties backed by the credible threat of enforcement measures. Dedicated experts on sexual and gender-based violence are routinely deployed to international monitoring and investigative mechanisms, and there is an ever-growing cadre of specialists in this field. The operational arms of my mandate are delivering concrete projects on the ground to support survivors funded through our dedicated CRSV multi-partner trust fund. We also have on the public historical record 15 annual reports of the Secretary General on CRSV, which not only documents incidents, patterns, and trends of sexual violence employed as a tactic of war, torture, terrorism, and political uh, reprisal, political repression, but also list or names and shames the parties responsible, including both state and non-state actors. Uh, furthermore, the Secretary General has, since 2009, published annual reports on the responsibility to protect, which have explored various dimensions of the issue, including in 2020, the nexus with the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. 
and, and, and that report noted the need to deepen understanding of the gender drivers and dynam dynamics of atrocity crimes in order to help states, regional organizations, and other actors more effectively and holistically discharge their responsibility to protect. As part of our operational methodology, which focuses on the anchoring of commitments at the national level, my office has signed a dozen of joint communique and frameworks of cooperation to prevent and address conflict-related sexual violence with many of the countries that fall within my remit. And this aligns very closely with the primary obligation of states to prevent atrocity crimes under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the 1949 Geneva Conventions, and overall international human rights, human rights law treaties. As the UN, we can support, but can never supp supplant the primary responsibility of states to protect their population. In my role as special representative, I have repeatedly called for swift and rigorous investigation to ensure accountability as a central and critical pillar of prevention, deterrence, and non-repetition. The failure to acknowledge and address atrocities is the surest sign that they will continue unabated. Ensuring accountability is essential to prevent genocide and related crimes, laying grounds to address root causes, reinstate the rule of law, and reestablish solid foundations for the future. This is paramount and non-negotiable. Accountability mechanisms and processes provide victims and survivors with the justice they deserve, while honoring their dignity by meaningfully engaging them and ensuring their voices are heard. While not an easy feat, accountability as a means for atrocity prevention is a long-term undertaking that must be complemented by immediate actions to collect and preserve potential evidence and treat urgently the immediate needs of survivors so they can start to heal and recover. As Secretary General Guterres has stated, when we talk about war crimes, we cannot forget that the worst of crimes is war itself. Next month, I plan to visit Chad and Port Sudan to meet with Sudanese refugees and Chadian returnees that have fled Sudan since the start of the hostilities in, in April 2023. What we are again witnessing in Sudan, including in Darfur and Khartoum region, is unspeakable levels of CRSV being perpetrated, mainly against women and children, and other acts of grave human rights violations with prevailing signs and, and risk factors for genocide and related crimes. The unacceptable cyclical nature of violence in Sudan makes it abundantly clear that no amount of protection or assistance is a substitute for peace. The aim of my mandate and that of the wider Women, Peace and Security agenda is not simply a war without rape, but a world without war. And the people of Sudan have been crying out for peace now for over a decade. For those that work in this field, there is agreement uh, that prevention is the best protection. And in order to enhance structural and op operational prevention of atrocity crimes within the context of the WPS agenda, there are four key observations and recommendations to chart the way forward. Firstly, the absence of women from genocide and related crimes prevention effort is deafening. We can no longer treat women as only victims, when in many contexts from Syria, Myanmar, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, women are active agents of prevention and accountability efforts. It is our responsibility as the international community to ensure that peace works equally for women and that we take seriously women's engagement as the co-creators of holistic solutions. Secondly, amplifying the voices of survivors and affected communities in prevention efforts is essential. In this respect, we must protect women, women human rights defenders, many of whom are bringing gender-based atrocity crimes to the attention of the world. 
their role in prevention efforts must be supported within the communities and space they operate. The safety of victims and witnesses who bravely come forward to testify must be guaranteed, as well as that of journalists who risk their lives to share these stories with the world. Third, we must be reminded that past instances of genocide, including the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, demonstrated that these crimes do not happen in a vacuum. They are duly planned and coordinated, meaning that there are identifiable early signs, risk factors, and indicators of genocide and related crimes that make it possible to take action to prevent them. The United Nations Framework of Analysis for Atrocity Crimes and my Office Framework for the Prevention of CRSV both provide the basis to detect these risk factors and inform early warning. And finally, accountability efforts need to be bolstered. This includes through the promotion of the universal ratification of the Genocide Convention and other relevant international treaties, followed by their full domestication at the national level, such as the adoption of relevant legislation to cr criminalize the prohibited conducts and allow for their investigation and prosecution by domestic courts. At the individual level, Building an environment that encourages women to come forward and report atrocity crimes is also tied to such accountability efforts. While we have seen in recent years a number of gender justice milestones in Guatemala, in the DRC, Colombia, in third states, uh, pursuant to the principle of universal jurisdiction and in jurisprudence of the ICC, the fact remains, as was pointed out earlier this morning, that the pace of justice is painfully slow, and many women have survived wars only to die, waiting for their day in court or for the delivery of reparations. We need to improve the quality of justice, not just the number of prosecutions, to ensure it is timely, accessible, and empowering. In short, we must bring all political, diplomatic, humanitarian, economic, coercive, and non-coercive tools to bear to avert atrocities. In this regard, the aims of my mandate and that of prevention of atrocity crimes are mutually reinforcing. Excellencies, colleagues, the bandwidth of our, com of our international community is limited, but even as the eyes of the world are fixated on the horrors in Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine, we cannot avert our gaze from other entrenched conflicts where the needs of survivors and populations at risk remain unmet. From Yemen to the DRC, to Sudan, Haiti, Syria, Mali, Myanmar, the refugee camps <coughs> of Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, to Ethiopia, Nowhere is the level of political resolve and resources equal to the scale of the challenge. At this moment, several states are making deep cuts to their official development assistance, even though sustainable and inclusive development is the surest way to prevent conflict, preserve peace, and promote women's rights. We must recognize that there is no other way to close the prote protection gap than by first closing the funding gap. And yet, both gaps continue to grow. We know that preventing genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crime against humanity is an ongoing process that requires sustained effort over time to build the education and resilience of societies. Ensuring that the rule of law is respected and that all human rights are protected without discrimination Establishing legitimate uh, and accountable national institutions, eliminating corruption, managing diversity constructively, and supporting a strong and diverse civil society and pr uh, pluralistic media are just some ways that we as an international community can come together to guarantee prevention as protection under the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. We need to bring the full repertoire of skills and perspectives to bear in confronting the challenges of our time. We know that local women are often the first to raise the red flag about 
rising extremism and radicalization, hate speech, the accumulation of small arms and light weapons, and the mobilization and recruitment strategies of armed groups. And yet, they are the last to be heard and heeded by security stakeholders. Security policy is still a male-dominated domain, despite clear and compelling evidence linking gender equality and women's participation with durable peace. Now is the time for unity to replace impunity. Impunity is rampant, affecting individuals, communities, and whole nations, further fueled by toxic masculinity, misogyny, patriarchy, autocracy, and gender apartheid. Even when we prevent atrocity crimes, protection games will not be sustainable in the absence of equality, empowerment, accountability, and the rule of law. We must confront a better society where no military or political leader is above the law and no woman or girl is beneath the scope of its protection. It means silencing the guns and unmuting the voices of women. Peace is not a passive state. It must be proactively waged because what is at stake for all of us is the quiet miracle of an ordinary life, a life free from violence. I would urge each one of us to reflect on what we will make of this moment. 30 years later, what would we say to Lawrence Nyonga Nagira, who survived the Tutsi genocide, where 37 of her relatives were killed, who said those who killed innocent people got nothing from their crimes. No one can think about doing it again. Will the injunction of never again continue to ring hollow? Will humanitarian action and civilian protection go down in the history of ideas as a long litany of too little, too late? And will international law and the multilateral system be able to deliver on the commitments to protect civilians from heinous and vi violent attacks? In these uncertain times, I believe that doubt is justified, but despair is not. Process is not progress. Norms have no power unless they are respected, implemented, and enforced. If we are to truly meet our responsibility to protect, then none of us can rest until every woman and girl, every innocent civilian can sleep under the cover of justice and peace. Thank you. Thank you.